Everybody take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we ask Him to help us as we look at this scripture. Holy Father, as we come into your presence again uh, and we open the pages of your precious book, First and foremost, uh, I ask that you take this vessel of clay that I yield to you, and that you would speak through it words of wisdom that would not only feed our soul, but God, that your word will fill us so full that we'll spill over out into a lost, a dying, and an uncaring world that others may see Christ. As we study this word this evening, May we glean the truth that you would have us to know from it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and I want us to just kind of read the scripture as we go along this evening. And I want to bring to you a thought that I've titled, A Walk Through Heart. A Walk Through Heart. Now, I've never really studied the heart that much, but uh, there was a heart in a Chicago museum, so it said, through which you as an individual could walk through as you studied the anatomy of the heart. Now, it uh, made the structure and the function of the heart very plain and very clear. Now, I want us to look at this chapter from the perspective of a trip through the heart of the Apostle Paul. And I want us to walk through Paul's heart, and I want us to see some of the things that we find in Paul's heart. Uh, maybe these are some of the things that you and I need to have in our heart. Now, there are several things that I want us to see in this, and the first thing that I want you to get is the propriety of transparency. Are you transparent? Let's look at verse 2 through 5. The Bible says here, Receive us, we have wronged no man, we have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and to live with you. Now great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I'm exceedingly joyful in our tribulation. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. You know, one of the most important things that you and I can have as children of God is a life of transparency. One of the things that I remember when I first moved into a what we Baptists call pastorium, uh, I was told when I moved into the pastorium that I would be living in a goldfish bowl. That everybody would be able to come in and out of my home and and watch my lives in the way, or watch our lives in the way that we lived, and, and uh, such as that. But you know, friend, God wants us to be so true to who He is when we get saved by the grace of God that we can be transparent. Now, there's a lot of people who don't want to be transparent. And uh, whenever I begin to to think about that, you and I are really trained 
never to let anyone into our lives, never to let anyone into our hearts, and never to admit to anything. In fact, my friend, it's not too hard for most of us to be that way. Now, it is questioned whether that approach is right, and Paul pretty much helps us to answer that in these few verses of Scripture. Now, before we get back into the Scripture, I've been told in my own life by uh, an individual who held a very prominent position in the church, I was told by an individual that, Danny, you're just too transparent. I said, well, praise God. I said, I'm glad to be that way. I said, because my Lord was transparent. He didn't try to hide anything from anybody. And I believe that's the way that God wants us to live our lives. Now, we don't any need to look real spiritual like we don't have skeletons in our closet because we all have sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. And, and so we've all, uh, we've, We've done some things in life that we're ashamed of. I, I will assure you that if you'll go rattling those bones around in your closet, you'll find some things in there that you're not too proud of. But when you get saved by the grace of God, God wants us to live a life in such a way that we can be proud of the life that we're living for Him. And whenever we begin to go back to this scripture and we look at it, we need to understand its background. Now, Paul, have you ever said anything and just questioned some of the things that you've said before? Yes. I think that maybe Paul is doing some of this because if you, if you really begin to get into this and you dig into the meat of this, Paul had written a letter, likely the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, where he had dealt with, with, uh, with many problems. And he dealt with those problems firmly. And uh, he had probably experienced second thoughts regarding how he had dealt with the problems. But now Paul reveals to us a, a tremendous amount of his inner self. Look back at verse 2. It says, we've wronged no man, we've corrupted no man. What is Paul saying there? Paul is trying to say to the church of Corinth, Though I've had to preach to you and though I've had to deal with some of these problems that you had very firmly, I've not wronged you. And so Paul is, is trying to say, look, I've got a clear conscience over what I had to do. I've got a clear conscience in, in what I had to do. Now look at verse 3. He said, I speak not this to condemn you. For I have said before that you are in my hearts to die and to live with you. Now what is Paul saying there? Paul is saying, hey, I love you. I have a love for you. In fact, I love you so much that I want to live among you. I want to live with you. And I want to die with you. Now, in verses 4 and 5, he kind of has uh, some uh, contrasting emotions. He talks about uh, when they were coming to Macedonia and uh, he had no rest whatsoever. He was troubled on every side. There were fightings without and fightings within and fears and tears and having to deal with all of these things. I'm going to tell you what, that's hard. It's hard because a pastor loves people and he wants to please everybody. But you know what I've learned in doing this for a long time? You can't please everybody. And ain't ain't good grammar, but everybody ain't going to like you. When I started this a long time ago, I said I'm going to be so good at what I do that everybody's going to love me. Everybody's going to like me. And now that I've been doing it as long as I've done, I wonder sometimes if anybody likes me or if anybody loves me. You see, the thing is, you can't please everybody. One of the things that I remember Brother John saying to me is, Son, you can please some of the people some of the time, 
And there's some of the people you won't ever please any other time. And that's kind of what Paul is having to deal with here as he opens his heart up in a transparent way to let the church of Corinth read what's going on into his life. Now I'm going to tell you something. We've got a few children of God in this church that reads me like a book from time to time. You know how I know that? Because they'll come to me and they'll say things to me that lets me know that they're reading me like a book. My precious little wife can read me like a book. Uh, but there's some of you as children of God. You, you can read me like a book. You know whenever I'm under a, a heavy load. That's called being transparent. Now, it's not easy to show that side sometimes. But God wants us to show that side. We're all human. I think everybody in here is human. Amen. Amen. And so, so we, all, we all have those sides. And, and so Paul is, is letting them know that he has a crushing concern. And the outcome of, of his letter to them was much on his heart. And, and what he needed, what he really needed, was for somebody to come up to him and affirm him in his message. Sometimes your preacher just needs affirmation of his message. Not that he needs some pat on the back or for you to build him up because, my goodness, he don't need to be built up. Jesus needs to be built up. Amen. But every now and then, whenever you preach a message that's not so easy to preach, sometimes it's good to have affirmation. And so he's trying to get affirmation from his church, and all of this speaks to his transparency. So it's very obvious that... that, that Sometimes, and it's proper to do so, to affirm the preacher. Actually, it's probably very positive to do so. So Paul was truly transparent in his heart. He was an open book for his congregation to read. And if I have one desire in my heart, that's exactly what I want to be to this congregation. An open book for you to read not hiding anything from you whatsoever. But to be an open book, to be transparent so that you can see my life. And I hope to live my life in such a way that when you see my life, that you see the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now the second thing that I want you to see is in verse 6 and 7, and then verse 13 through 16. And the second thing that I want us to see is the essential uh, of encouragement. Now, I want you to know that all encouragement comes from God. All encouragement comes from God. Look at verse uh, 6. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. God's going to send somebody to bring comfort. He's going to do that. That's just the way He is. He's God. He's going to send somebody to bring comfort. All of us from time to time need to be comforted. And now God Himself can comfort you through His Word. But isn't it good to have somebody Somebody that can reach into your life and somebody that can make a difference in your life. Isn't that good? Amen. Somebody that can just stop by and encourage you with the Word and help to bring comfort to your heart. Paul was very thankful that God sent Titus. He was comforted by the coming of Titus. Now, we see the message of Titus in verse 7. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your favorite mind toward me, so that I rejoiced more. Now, what was his message? Paul, don't be upset with the Corinthians. Man, they love you. 
They care for you. And, and, and they want to hear from you. Man, don't you know this made the preacher feel good? Don't you know that he had some type of encouragement in his heart? You see, Titus brought words of their reaction to Paul's letter. He brought words of their continual love for Paul. Paul is a little bit concerned because he's written the letter, but now all of a sudden he's getting news that, hey, they loved the letter. Sometimes we just need to hear a word from God. Now we may not like what we're hearing when we hear it, but if it makes us break down and begin to search our heart and see ourselves for who we are and what we need to do, then it makes a difference. Amen. Somebody posted something on a church sign that I read, and it said something like this. America basically needs to bless God. And it's the truth. We say God bless America but how can we bless America whenever we legalize sin? And we say it's all right to sin. And so what we need to do is bless God with a repentant heart. If my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. There is a healing for our country. But it's got to start at the church house. Whenever God's people gets right, maybe the country will get right. Man, there was a time that people had a desire to go to the house of God. You could just about go out and pay people to come now and they wouldn't come. My goodness. And so, so Paul was addressing all of these problems that that, that the church had had. Now, look at the experience of Titus himself. Go to verse 13. It says, uh, Yea, and I'm going to read the latter portion of verse 13. Yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. For I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. But as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting which I made before Titus is found a truth. And his inward affection is more abundant toward you whilst he, re he remembereth the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. I rejoice therefore that I have confidence in you in all things. So he had been well received. Titus had been well received by the Corinthians. One of the greatest things that a preacher can have uh, to happen to him is to be well received. Man, I've been some places where I hadn't been well received. I've been some places before that I was glad to get out of there. I've been some places before that I hoped I could get out of there. <laughs> but God's always provided. But he was well received. His reception had confirmed all that Paul had said to them. All that Paul ha had, had preached to them. The things that Paul had to deal with in their, in their sin. And, and the things that Paul had to deal with in their hurt. And, and Paul needed encouragement at this point, And he received it. And God sent a man. And that man encouraged him. Listen, God uses human means many times to communicate his encouragement. Now what am I trying to say to you? You may be the only mouthpiece that God will use. Did you know that? You may be the only hands that God will use. You may be the only feet that God will go through. Have you ever just had God to say something to you? and you didn't follow through with what the Lord said to you? I think we all have. I will never forget, and, and, and the only th reason that this comes back to mind is, is my friend visited with me uh, this past week. 
he stopped by and encouraged me a little bit. And then somehow God sends somebody by just to encourage you. Had an old friend uh, that actually was a deacon at Holt Baptist Church, and he and I got real close. He, he got to be like a brother to me. And he called me and he said, Brother Danny, so I'm over in Nashville. He said, uh, been over here doing a little bit of work. And he said, we've been talking about going and breaking bread together. We Baptists like to break bread, amen. <laughs> he said, what do you think about us going and, and getting something to eat together? I said, well, that'll be good. He said, well, I'm going to call my wife to see if she can break free. And, and uh, we, you know, we'll go, you and you and Martin, me and Susan, we'll go. We'll go. And uh, worked out. I said, well, we'll go to the Mexican restaurant. Hadn't been to the Mexican restaurant lately. I, I like to go to the Mexican restaurant every now and then. You know, I, I like fajitas pretty good. And, uh, but Joy didn't want to do that. He wanted to go to Ray's Mill Pond. And so we decided to go to Ray's Mill Pond. That was good. And, oh, we had such a good time of fellowship. It was wonderful. But I remember a time whenever Joey and I were out visiting. I was pastor of Hope Baptist Church. He, he was my song leader and my chairman of deacons. And Joey and I was riding around in a community. We had ridden around all night long, seemingly. And it was getting pretty late. It was about 9, 9.30. And we hadn't been able to hit the first home where anybody would let us in. In fact, we stopped at one home. A lady sicked her dog on us. Didn't take us long to get away from there. You hear what I'm talking about? <laughs> we got away from there pretty quick. And uh, we got down to the end of the dirt road, and God spoke to my heart. We had a couple in our church that was having some marital problems. We got down to the end of the road. They had separated, and the man was living in a little apartment, and she was still living in the home. And we got down to the end of the dirt road, and God spoke to my heart just as clearly. And I knew it was the Spirit of God speaking to me and says, you need to go see Ralph Threat. That was, that was his name. That's what I'm going to call him. That wasn't really his name. I'm going to just call him that, okay? You need to go see Ralph Threat. And so uh, we'll just say that we got to the end of the road and old brother Joy said, well, I guess you need to just take me to the house. It's 930. I said, no. I said, God just spoke to me. We're going to see old brother Ralph. He said, man, he's in the bed. He said, he goes to bed with the chickens. He said, he's in the bed. He said, I'm not going. I said, brother, I'm driving. I said, you're going. <laughs> and so uh, we, we rode to, like I said, his name wasn't Ralph, but that's what we're going to call him. We drove up to Ralph's little apartment. And I said, get out, Brother Joe, and go knock on the door. He said, I ain't going to do it. That's just the way he said it. He said, I ain't going to do it. He said, I told you he's in the bed. And so I get out, and I go up there, and I knock on the door quietly. He don't come. So I knock on the door loudly. I see a little light come on. He comes to the door with a shotgun in his hand. I take a step back. Started to turn around and run. He opens the door and he looks at me in tears, starts running down his face. And he said, who told you? I said, who told me what? He said, who told you what I was going to do? I said, nobody told me what you were going to do. I said, all I know is we come down to the end of the road and God told me I needed to come see you. He said, Brother Danny, he said, this is a double barrel shotgun, and he popped it open. He said, there's two shells in this shotgun, two double alt buck shells in this shotgun. He said, I was just about to get in my car and drive over to our house and kill my wife and then kill myself. What if I decided that night that that hadn't been God that was speaking to my heart? Now listen, I'm not pinning any roses on me. I just happened to hear from the Spirit of God. Let me tell you something. I missed it many times, but I didn't miss it that night. I didn't miss it that night. He got up the following Sunday after he and his wife got back together and testified in the church what he had planned to do and how that God sent his man and a deacon by to visit with him to keep him from doing that. You see, sometimes, sometimes... 
We need to be the human hands and the human mouthpiece and the feet that God uses. And there's so many times we've missed it because the Spirit of God tells us to do something and we say something like, that's not God. That's not God. The third thing that I want you to see is the assurance of understanding in verses 8 through 11. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I, per, I perceive the same uh, epistle had made some, or made you sorry, through it were, or though it rather were for a season. My eyes don't want to cooperate with me tonight for some reason. Uh, and then it says, Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive uh, damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this self same thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, uh, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearness of yourself, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, in all things ye have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. Paul is dealing with the reason that he wrote the letter. And it brings him to a place of repentance. Listen, it is the, it is the duty of a preacher of the gospel to reprove and to rebuke whenever we're not living right. It is the job of a preacher of the gospel to reprove and to rebuke and to bring us to a place of repentance before God. It don't feel good when you have to preach sermons like that. But they're necessary. Jeremiah preached those kind of sermons and the people rejected it so bad that they threw him in the sewer. But somebody loved him enough that they threw a rope down to him and pulled him up. <laughs> then the last thing, a desired relationship. Wherefore, though I write, verse 12, Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for this cause that some done wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort. Paul wanted a peculiar relationship with the Corinthian church. He wanted to be close to them. It's sad to say, but very few people will let you get close to them anymore. He wanted to care for them. The sad thing about being a preacher of the gospel many times is some people can get real upset with you because you don't visit them in the hospital. I guess probably one time in my ministry, if not more than once, I've had somebody to say, a preacher, I won't ever be back at your church no more. I was in the hospital all last week and you didn't even come to see me. The sad thing is, didn't know that she was in the hospital. Brother John Gibbs used to handle that like this. Well, sister, I guess you'll just have to move on to wherever it is God's going to send you because I failed mind reading in school. Nobody didn't tell me that you were in the hospital. You didn't bother to call me. When somebody approaches me and says, I'm upset with my pastor because I was sick and he didn't call and check on me, I'll always say this. Well, did you let him know that you were sick? You got to let your preacher know these things. He wants to care for you. He wants to care for you. He wants to pray for you. He wanted to care for them. But he wanted them to care for him. Hey, you ever heard what goes around comes around? <laughs> His purpose in writing the letter comes in here. It wasn't just for the ones who were sinning. It wasn't just for the ones that had sinned against God. It was for a relationship between them. Paul wanted a personal relationship rather than a professional relationship. 
You see, that's the problem with most churches today. They place their preacher on some pedestal and they put him in a professional relationship and he and his congregation, that word didn't want to come out, <laughs> he and the congregation just are on different levels. Listen, I want more than just a professional relationship with you. I want a personal relationship with you. I want to love you. And I want to be loved by you. Now, we've taken a journey this evening. We've walked through Paul's heart. And I trust that you can see the desire of God's man. He wanted to be transparent. He needed to be encouraged at times. He wanted others to understand why he did what he did, why he said what he said. And he wanted a mutual, helpful relationship. He wanted to be lovers with his congregation. Boy, it come out good then. He wanted their two hearts to be one. And that's the same desire that Jesus has for you as an individual. The heart of Jesus and your heart. To be one heart. That says it all, don't it? Amen. Stand with me if you will. Father, thank you so much for this Bible study this evening. Lord, you've let us walk through Paul's heart. And in walking through Paul's heart, maybe we've been able to see our own heart. And Father, I pray that as we come to a time of uh, commitment, decision, that we'll see ourselves through your eyes and make decisions accordingly. In Jesus' name, amen.